so there will be eight. And I really think, gosh, we had a really good turnout. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I wanted to introduce the team that's here tonight. Let's uh, say hello to our executive director, Betty Overstreet, right back there. And we've got uh, Barb Horowitz and Karen Cartier. Let's give them a round of applause. Raise your hands. We've got um, we've got John O'Neill in the back and Leanne, who's speaking, and we're glad uh, to have them tonight. So many people have helped out this semester. So thank you, everyone. Let's do a giveaway. Uh, grab your tickets. We're going to do an online giveaway too. We're going to do that at the end of the session. So grab your tickets, and we've got two great prizes. We're going to let the per we're going to let the person who wins the giveaway pick the prize. Someone handed me a note at the end of one of the classes. I'm sorry, I forget who it was who said you got to get this book called Mafia Democracy by Michael Franzies. It looked really good. How our republic became a mob racket. That's one book we're giving away. And then this, I think, will be a very good book too. Kaylee McEnany, For Such a Time as This. Whoever wins gets to pick the book that they want. So I hope your ticket is lucky. The ticket is last three digits, 608. 608, Donna. Congratulations. Let's give Donna a round of applause. Which book do you want? McEnany. The Kaylee McEnany book. Why am I surprised about that? Enjoy. Um, we may have you do a book report on that next semester, okay? Okay, that, that would be great. So when our board met recently, we talked about something that was serious, that I thought was really serious, and that's really how evil Google is. And I know we've talked about that before, but they keep getting worse. Um, I don't know, one of our speakers might mention that tonight, I don't know. But what I was concerned about was the fact that it's been proven, this is the required reading article tonight, that Google is sending email messages that are conservative-based. Our Empower You emails could be looked at that way, I guess. They're sending them uh, intentionally to spam folders of people who have Gmail accounts. Um, and this is an article, this is your required reading. I encourage you to read it because our board has pretty much made the decision that at the end of the year, which is um, about six months from now, that we're going to phase out sending emails to Gmail accounts, and uh, we'll be sending out an email. We'll be sending out an email. And hopefully, you'll get it uh, about that. I just encourage you if you've got a Gmail account and you love it, just go for it. But we'll be asking you to get a second email account, or many people may have a second email account because. We're just not going to send emails to a company that is intentionally not doing what they should be, which is delivering the mail. So I've got an article, I'll let you read it. I'll let you believe if it's true or not. Uh, I think it's an important article. For those of you who, there's a, there's a candidate that tried to run for governor. His name is Neil Peterson. Has anybody heard of him? Uh, we, had a, we had somebody in uh, collecting signatures for him at several Empower You. Um, events, just for those of you who know, he did not make it on the ballot today. That just came out. And I wanted to let you know, by popular demand, we will be showing the movie 2,000 Mules on August the 4th, um, which is, August the 4th is a, is a Thursday night, so it's tomorrow's third, is it two weeks from tomorrow? Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, Leanne, is that the right date, August 4th? Yes. August 4th, so two weeks from uh, tomorrow, we'll be showing that movie in Empower You Studio. I had a question whether everybody, many people had already seen it, but so many people said they wanted to see it. I think over half the people in the audience raised their hands. So uh, I hope you can reserve and come and see it. It's, it's a fun movie. Um, finally, I wanted to tell you about our Constitution Boot Camp. I, I don't know if we've got the picture or not that we had last Saturday morning. Um, this was just a breath of fresh air for me. This was 41 students that were aged uh, mostly in, I'd say sixth grade to 12th grade, who came in here at 8.30 in the morning to take a six hour class on the constitution. And what I wanna tell you about them, so many people 
in Empower You Land out there, contributed to buy gift cards for them. If they completed the class, they got a $25 gift card. I'm so appreciative. We're so appreciative for those of you who, who helped us with that. But it was such a breath air to see these young people and talk to them. And I forgot how asleep young people were at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> but they were tired. But you know what? They were excited. They didn't know what they were getting into. And I know it was a hard conversation, but it's just nice to see kids so full of life um, ready to take on the world. You know what else is nice to see? It's nice to see somebody who's passionate about a subject come and talk about it. And that's the case with uh, our guests who are going to talk about smart meters tonight. I'm going to introduce Vince in, in a second. I'm going to introduce the two second speakers because I'm going to go back and work the board a little bit. And I'm going to introduce the speakers who are going to speak second. So just bear with me. John O'Neill is going to be talking about India. And in John's 35-year professional career, he's participated in managed people and projects in corporate as well as consulting services industry. His professional background includes significant career experience in a broad spectrum of business disciplines like sales, technology, resources, corporate, and consulting services management. John has run for the last two semesters our Take 20 program, which is our part of the Empower You, where we have a speaker at the beginning of the class for 20 minutes. And he's just done a fantastic job, and he's just such a pleasure to work with. And when he mentioned India, I was so fascinated by it. I just am so thankful he stepped up and was willing to teach tonight. Leanne Cartier, who's going to be helping him teach, um, grew up in Cincinnati and graduated from Wilmington College. And she's always looking to learn new things. She's taught at Empower You on getting started gardening in the spring, um, in the spring semester. She also was really involved in the permaculture class. And really, the summer series has been her baby, so to speak. So let's give her a round of applause because she's done a great job. Um, they'll be speaking second. But Vince, and he's got uh, uh, another person here tonight with him, Monique, have been talking to Betty and I about uh, this, this next segment for a while, uh, maybe a year or a year or two. And we've just kept kind of saying, we, we'd like to hear more about it. We'd like to hear more about it. And it's so great when somebody's passionate about a subject that they'll can come forward and be prepared to tell you about it. And I think it's an important, as, as I in Glendale, just right up the street, prepare to get my smart water meter in a couple of weeks, I'm really glad to be able to hear about it. So our speaker tonight is Vince Whalich. Vince is a retired medical IT analyst he worked for many years in database software development, especially in areas related to accounting, energy, inventory control, and occupational health. In, the most, in his most recent past, he was employed as the occupational health administrator for a large consumer products company in Cincinnati for 10 plus years. He managed data access privileges to employ medical records for 32 un health units in North America. He provided end user support for the day-to-day -day operations of all medical database applications involving vendor interface devices. He developed data entry models for the in-house occupation, occupational health application as well as any related summary and or trend reporting. Uh, we welcome Vince Willich. Welcome Vince, come on up. Okay, because everybody get started here. Um, like Dan said, I, I um, we've been talking uh, for a, uh, over a year, I guess, to to uh, come here and talk about this issue with smart meters. And I I've been tracking not. I've been talking to uh, to Dan for a, a while and uh, Leanne about getting some time on here to maybe talk about the issue. I've been uh, following uh, the building part of the smart meters for a long time. Um, it's been a, uh, an issue that um, it, it, it's been addressed uh, sort of by the, uh, the legislators, but not, but not really uh, considered a, a really an issue. Um, I'm a, a board member of uh, SWART, 
which is, uh, it stands for Southwest Ohio for Responsible Technology. And it's, it's a nonpartisan group. We've got members uh, throughout Ohio and um, Northern Kentucky. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, Monique and she's, uh, she's at the meeting here and um, you may have already met her. Uh, she's also one of my neighbors. And I noticed one of my a shout out to my one of my other neighbors here who did the national or the song. Um, now Empire U has has posted these handouts on the, on that, that everybody has on the website, as well as some other handouts related to complaints associated with deep smarted meters. There's also a handout with information about three public hearings scheduled this month for the third uh, proposed Duke Energy rate increase for smart meters. Um, and we, we included that in the handouts tonight in, in case you would uh, want to submit a comment uh, through PUCO or Public Utilities Commission in, uh, of Ohio, their website, if you can uh, attend, if you can't attend the public hearing. Now the, the information um, on the do, on the utility bills, there's a lot of information flowing through it, and uh, it can be difficult to track, including um, the list of uh, rate increases and the riders that are added to the bill since Duke started installing the meters. So for that reason, uh, <clears throat> I kind of I created the handouts with a lot of detail so that maybe I wouldn't have to spend so much time talking. It, we, I really don't have enough time to go through all this and we can open it up to maybe a lot of questions. But as far as the, um, the first page on your handout, the study is a, um, it's a panel study that consists of a group of uh, residential customers who submitted monthly bills covering a period from 2018 to 2022 and the, uh, the panel members are actually SWORT members who are willing to uh, provide copies of their monthly bills in hard copy or digital format. Now, Monique, Monique was able to recruit enough people to participate in order to get uh, a desired number of, uh, well, in the medical world, uh, um, a panel of this type, you would you usually, you may only require maybe 12, 24, or 40 people, but you need a lot of a lot of results or test results. In this case, I wanted at least 200 bills. So everybody that was participated submitted um, at least one year of bills and others provided two or three years. So the number of accounts uh, is not as important as, as but the total, the total number of bills. Now, the, we don't we don't have the overhead, I guess, of the uh, of the first handout, but it, it shows a, a summary of the uh, of the billing study for those who've got the handout, and um, you can see that there's a the monthly fees were very high for such a low average monthly usage. Um, when you think about this, it's it's amazing when you look at these percentages. Of the 225 bills that were submitted for the panel, over 50% of them had a total, total cost on the monthly fees of over $90. And monthly fees are the uh, sum of the, um, the uh, gas and electric delivery charge or fixed charges. And then there's a delivery rider for gas and electric. Those two together make up your monthly fees. And they're, they're not related to um, um, the supplier rates at all. That's a totally different uh, cost item in the bill itself. And your, your total bill um, itself consists of the, um, the supplier rate, distribution rate, and then the rider. And the rider is the big, if you look at your uh, second page on the handout, the uh, the uh, tariff page, those are the, the riders and those are the billing tariffs that are assigned to each, each rate code on the bill. If you look at the bottom of the, of the page, that's example of right out of a bill. It gives you all the, all the parameters 
that go into um, to the um, delivery charges. For this entry here at the bottom, this is $100 for fixed cost. If you, if you add up all the items. Now the, the delivery right or the um, the tariffs themselves, the rate codes, they're they're uh, I, I I tried to color code them on on the tariff sheet, and uh, they are um, majority of them are, are are hidden. They're not they're not listed on your bill. It's it's a uh, it's a group charge. If you look on the example at the bottom, where it just says delivery riders over on the on the right for the electric. If you uh, look at that number, that's that's a group charge of all these different uh, tariffs. So they're 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 hidden, and you don't you don't know what the you don't know which charge is prevalent. And 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 in a, in a panel like this, there was only there were sixteen accounts, so you don't know which which charge or which uh, code is prevalent. The more importantly, is you don't know if they're being evenly applied to all everybody, and. I mean, they're they're hidden for a reason. <laughs> anyway, this this page is, is part of the um, the the rate increase that um, Duke is is has submitted to uh, the Public Utilities Commission, and there's public hearings going on right now. But this this page and these and some of these distribution codes are part of those that rate increase. They want to increase those. If you look on the on the on the on the page on the details. Each code, uh, it's, they call them riders, and it's a little bit like a, uh, if you have a life insurance policy and you want to get a disability uh, rider on the policy, you just add a, you know, $2.80 a month. That's a rider. Some of these fees are, 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 that, are like that. They're fixed. <laughs> but the majority of them have their own um, calculation based on your usage. And the... The riders are, are all based on the, uh, the calculation is based on the distribution charges. So it has nothing to do with your supplier rate. You can have a zero supplier rate and your, your, uh, your, um, this, your distribution costs are gonna be the same because those rates are fixed. You have a utility, the fixed uh, rider or the fixed code for both gas and electric has been set for a long, long time. It's been five or six years since it's been changed, but they keep updating the um, these rider codes, and that's what that's what uh, <clears throat> that's how they're funding these these smart meters. If you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, third page that, that goes over the uh, covers the smart meter. Uh, components, you can see that the overcharges uh, with the meters started over 10 years ago. They started in installing them and you can go through the, uh, the years there and you can see um, that they've been replacing the existing ones because uh, smart meters are, are uh, their computers <laughs> and they need to be updated with software and they need to be replaced. Let me just go through a couple other things and then we could maybe uh, just have some questions because there's a lot of, there's, there's so much detail in these and I, I, I wasn't able to, to uh, I, did, I wasn't able to put this together so that it would be you know, more of a class, but I, I thought it would be better that if we um, just had a lot of questions. Um, the PUCO and the legislators and the other state agencies, they know all about these high fees but no action has to determine if the fee total is related to the higher number of utility shutoffs and collections. One of the things that was interesting I found in, in the results was that any single month um, where your, your, kilowatt, your, hour, your kilowatt per hour usage exceeds 900, it puts you in that 70 to $100 uh, rider charge. So, uh, you can see that in the bottom of that tariff page. That's a, a perfect example of what goes on um, in the uh, monthly calculations. There's a uh, there's a big uh, turnover of the 
of the cost, as soon as you exceed that 900 kilowatt hours, if you look at the, at the front page uh, that has the percentages, you can see that 84%, 190 of 225, had a total cost of $75. <clears throat> What's interesting that came out of the panel too is that the, the, um, if you look down at the, um, the panel study, the, uh, the uh, monthly average of 628 as a median, but yet the national average and the Ohio average is, is over 900. So you have all these, all these people that are already energy efficient <laughs> and they're paying up to between 70 and $100 a month in fixed costs. So uh, that was a, uh, the main purpose of the study was to get, to track the usage and to see how much these, these costs were actually related to the usage. And um, it's just um, the, it's just that the, the, the um, when the items are hidden, a person can't, you can't determine which rates are, are, are prevalent as part of the group. And um, given, uh, given Duke's history on discounting, I would, I would love to know the 16 uh, uh, hidden costs on the people in the panel. Um, let's see here. Uh, from the panel results also, the delivery rider charges for a single month, uh, kilowatt usage can range from $22 for a for 1,000 kilowatts up to $50 to two th for 2,000. So it, it's, uh, if anybody uh, wants to, uh, I don't know if anybody happened to bring a bill with them tonight, but I'd be interested to see if anybody is even at the national air reach at 900. Um, as far as the smart meters, uh, an electric smart meter is uh, much the same as other Internet of Things IoT based products like a smart TV or smart refrigerator. It's wrapped in privacy and security concerns. Uh, the federal IoT guidelines that establish minimum security standards for IoT devices procured by the federal government is moving closer to becoming law. However, the smart meter uh, can't be disconnected and discarded unless the owner wants to lose total power to the home. Matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> two years ago, I, I think it was two years ago, one, one of your guest speakers, he spent an hour and a half telling you to hook, unhook everything from the internet. And uh, he's one of the favorites, I guess, here. And uh, at the end, I asked him a question. Oh, okay, how can I unhook my smart meter? And he said, you can't because of $30 opt-out. So it's, it, it's an issue that people are staying away from. But in the long run, if you look at it, the uh, 30, uh, $30 uh, dollar opt-out is really, uh, it's really a, a short, uh, it's not as a, a shortcoming as you would think, given that the, the extra costs that these people are paying that are over the, uh, the national average. Um, the residential smart meter installations result in both unwanted and forced surveillance. Currently, utility smart meters, they aren't safe, they don't have surge protectors, and are prone to fires and explosions. <clears throat> Advanced meters must be properly grounded and have surge protection that is adequately rated in order to divert a lightning strike or some kind of short circuit incident. All these new power grid infrastructures, infrastructures are essentially large distributed networks of computers that can be hijacked for financial gains. This means that criminal organizations have an ongoing mission to steal utility assets and sell them back to the utility. These bad actors go after what a utility relies on the most to operate data and grid in infrastructure. Malware can be developed to target smart meters launch it and take control of tens of thousands of not millions of smart meters. The attackers then change the targeted utility security keys, pushing the utility out of their own infrastructure. Now utilities are accepting these types of security risks 
via remote software update because they expect the newly built computerized infrastructures will gain new capabilities, thus increasing the return on investment. So that, that's, the, that's the company line that you, you will hear a lot about uh, moving everything to the smart, to the smart grid. It's, uh, hey Vince, we, yes. we have time for one or two questions. Okay, I'm sorry. I tried to write the, the de you know, as much detail so that hopefully we'd have a, some time for some questions. This is just a hard topic uh, to cover in such a short time. I know when I talk to uh, people, some people will ask me, uh, how does the uh, aggregation program, how's that working on my bill? And other people will say, what's aggregation? So. Can you tell your name to the mic, please? My name is Nancy. If you're looking at your meter on your house, how do you know if you have a smart meter or not? Well, it's there's the smart meter. It, a smart meter is is a uh, it's, it's it's digital. It's 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 a digital display. It's not an analog that that wheels. That's what they've been replacing over time. So you can opt out. <clears throat> if you pay the thirty dollar opt out fee, you get a, you get a smart meter that's disconnected to the wireless, but it's it's still it, it can't transmit uh, data back and forth. But if, if you have a digital meter, that's that's a smart meter. They've been replacing these for, I don't know, all over Cincinnati for how long? Well, if you look at the second, at the, uh, the pay, if you look at the page of the second, the, you have to opt out. You have to opt out to have that $30 charge. If you have not called to opt out, then you are not paying that $30 charge and you have smart meters on your home. You can see that in the sample on, on the second page the, at the bottom, there's an AMI opt out fee, $30. Yeah, it's monthly. We have one last question over here. That's what keeps everybody with the, uh, keeps everybody from changing because of that $30. But if you look at the usage that came out of this panel, in the long run, you're, you're $30. See, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been, I opted out two years ago, but my, my, in 2021, my average uh, fixed cost is $103 a month. And my, and my usage is below the national average. I did the energy efficient things. I replaced it by air conditioning, my furnace, water heater. And matter of fact, that's what brought this study about. Monique and I were talking about how could we get this information out, but it's just very difficult to, uh, I, I've had this data for since last summer. And I, I did send it to the Ohio C Consumer Council to try to get some analysis done, no response. It's just like a hidden, it's like a third rail. <laughs> you, can't, you can't talk about it because ever since uh, went, up, went on in the state house, there, people were arrested, people resigned. It's all due to this back door uh, uh, on these, uh, these um, riders. I, I got a question. Um, two weeks ago, um, I guess it was a uh, contractor for Duke came and removed the boxes off the uh, telephone pole, which was the receiver for the smart meter. They say they're no longer using the uh, wireless part it, that the smart meter puts it right into the thing. So how would that affect the uh, radio frequency stuff that's going on? Well, they, didn't they replace the, uh, the network itself? They had boxes on the certain telephone poles that that's supposed to communicate. They originally um, installed, and I have a lot of information. There's an email address at the bottom of some of these sheets, and I'd be happy to send more information, but I'm going to try to summarize this quickly. In the beginning, they installed certain smart meters. They went around and started replacing those meters um, around 2017 or 2018. The first set of smart meters had their own infrastructure. Um, and then the second set of smart meters has different infrastructure. Duke 
is removing the first in infrastructure, I guess, when they're getting around to it. Otherwise, it's staying up. That may be what's going on in your neighborhood. I don't know that they have to be in a hurry to take down the infrastructure for this first set of smart meters that were installed. There were like over 700,000 originally installed. And those are all being replaced. And that's, that's what's in these, when you read these uh, bills that are being passed or looked over in, in the legislature, you, whenever they're talking about distribution charges, that's what this is. This is how they how they get it in there, and the uh, the um, codes are um, hidden, so you don't really know what what's being charged. All right, thank you, Vince. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, my esteemed colleague and I are going to discuss the surprise that is India. There are a few Americans who have much or any knowledge of most of the countries of the world or even where in the world they are. I think one of the reasons for that is that we have so many areas in this country to see, experience and learn about that we just do not have time to study and learn about other areas of our world. On the other hand, people in other countries have English as a second language, and they know quite a bit about America because a lot of them are motivated to come live here because of the opportunities that our great country promises. Now, my own first exposure, is this on? Thank you. My own first exposure and impressions of the country of India was from that great historical documentary, Ganga Din. I am sure some of you remember that film. So this is what I thought India looked like. While I was ill-informed as to what I thought at the time was its typical landscape, this picture does portray to a degree of accuracy the violence and unrest that has plagued India from its inception. And this is what India does look like in some areas of that country. Not that long ago, India was a far away, mysterious and violent place. Most Americans had never met an Indian or traveled there and probably never would. So tonight, we believe that our presentation will provide all of you with a better understanding of the country that is India. We certainly learned a lot. <clears throat> so India officially, the Republic of India is a country in South Asia. It is the seventh largest country by area the second most populous country with one, over 1.25 billion people uh, and the most populous democracy country in the world. So where is it? So we have <clears throat> on the Asian continent, uh, it occupies the greater part of uh, South, South Asia. <clears throat> and on the North, we are bordered by the Himalayan mountains. 
The Himalayas stretch across the northeastern portion of India. They cover approximately 1,500 miles and pass the nations of India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, Bhutan, and Nepal. Now, India, Nepal, and Bhutan have sovereignty over most of the Himalayans, and the Himalayans are home to the third largest ice deposits in the world, right after the Arctic and Antarctica. Some of the Himalayan glaciers are as long as 43 miles. There, there are medicinal herbs found in the foothills of the Himalayas, and they are considered to be the purest in the world. On the east, we have the Bay of Bengal, which is the arm of the Indian Ocean between India and Sri Lanka on the west, Bangladesh on the north, and Southeast Asia on the east. The Bay of Bengal is the largest bay in the world, and it forms the northeastern part of the Indian Ocean. Roughly triangular in shape, it is bordered mostly by India. It is the largest water region referred to a bay in the world. During the existence of British India, it was named uh, the Bay of Bengal after the historic Bengal region, which is modern day Bangladesh. The Indians and the Indian states of West Bengal, Tripura, and the Barak Valley of Southern Assam. The Bay of Bengal occupies an area of a million square miles. On the west, On the west, we have the Arabian Sea. The Arabian Sea is a region of northern India, of the northern Indian Ocean, bounded by the, on the east by India. The Arabian Sea covers a surface area of approximately a million five hundred thousand square miles. The maximum width of the Arabian Sea is a thousand five hundred miles, and its maximum depth is fifteen thousand feet. The largest river that flows into the Arabian Sea is the Indus River. Water from the rivers, after, right after a heavy rain, bring mud, uh, decomposed leaves, trees, minerals, and salinity with it. And when all this uh, muddy brown water from the river mixes with salt water from the sea, it turns the seawater black. So who are India's neighbors? Well, the neighboring countries of India are Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, Nepal, Tibet, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. With the exception of Sri Lanka, they are located on the northern border of the country. So what does India look like? They have deserts. And when used in the context of India, the word R-A-N-N -N means desert. And it often conjures up images of massive golden sand dunes, camels bumpily walking towards the horizon, colorfully clad men and women going about their chores of bonfires at night and of starry skies. Seldom does the word sketch the stark mountainous Himalayan desert or the gleaming white sand palms of Kutch that are far less traversed by travelers to, despite being equally, if not more romantic than the great Rajasthan Thar Desert. <clears throat> so the Sandy Thar Desert is in Rajasthan, India, and it's also known as the Great Indian Desert. And it's a large arid region in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent that covers an area of 77,000 square miles and forms a natural boundary between India and Pakistan. It is the world's 20th largest desert and the world's ninth largest hot subtropical desert. About 85% of the Thar Desert is in India. Beyond, beyond the last major city of Jasmalur, the desert stretches to the horizon and is littered with small sediments, sometimes with just half a dozen huts to a village, where life is akin to the desert itself, sweltering hot in the day and freezing at night. Average temperatures vary with season and extremes can range from near freezing in the winter to more than 122 degrees in the summer. Average annual rainfall ranges from four inches to 20 inches, 
and occurs during the short July to September Southwest monsoon. The Trans Himalayas Desert. This dramatic landscape includes the regions of Lada and Spiti. As you climb atop the mountains on the roof of the world, traverse the highest inhabited villages in the Himalayas and follow centuries old Buddhist trails, the Himalayas reveal to you a magnificent desert that is hard not to fall in love with. <clears throat> on the leeward side of the mighty Himalayas, Spiti is home to some of the starkest, most stunning landscapes made by the bare brown mountains which receive abundant sunlight and snow, but no rain. Almost no vegetation can survive on such rough terrain, making the slightest hint of greenery or color a treat for the eyes. It is a cold desert with winter temperatures touching minus 22 degrees and an average annual rainfall of only four inches. The third desert we're going to discuss is the white salt desert of Kutch. And whoever says brown is the dominant color of a desert hasn't been to the large expanse of bright white salt that is the great Ron of Kutch, a salt marsh in the Thar Desert along the west coast of India. On any winter night, this white desert lights up with a reflection of the moon and the millions of stars that twinkle in its sky. There's nothing but white as far as you can see, nothing but you and the vastness of the desert. It is about 2,900 square miles in area and is reputed to be one of the largest salt deserts in the world. This is one of the hottest areas of India with summer temperatures averaging and peaking at 120 degrees. Winter temperatures, however, reduce dramatically and can go below 32 degrees. Now, India is not all inhospitable <laughs> land. We have um, many lush valleys in India. Um, not all of India is just mountains or deserts, nor is it inhospitable. <laughs> so India also has some of the most beautiful country, um, which provides rich soil and appropriate rainfall to enable India to be the largest producer of spices milk, tea, cashew, and jute. They are the second largest producer of wheat, rice, fruit, and vegetables, sugarcane, <laughs> cotton, and oil seeds. Uh, further, India is second in the global pop production of fruits and vegetables and is the largest producer of mango and banana. It is also one of the leading producers of spices, fish, poultry, livestock, and plantation crops. The agricultural sector is one of the most important industries in the Indian economy, which also means it's a huge employer. Approximately 60% of the Indian population works in this industry, contributing to about 18% of India's GDP. Some more pictures on the Indian countryside. We have uh, Manglahea, a state in Northeast India, might be the wettest place on earth. Some areas can receive nearly 40 feet of rainfall in an average year. So any road construction that involves crossing waterways must be able to tolerate the wear and tear of the monsoon season when a bubbling creek can quickly become a raging torrent. And enter the banyan tree. A few varieties of the snarly root tree grow wild in this region. For centuries, locals have trained the trees to grow across ravines and waterways, resulting in an impressive network of living bridges in and around the villages of Meghalaya. The root <clears throat> and branch bridges are aided by stones, ropes, and planks, but the tree's firm hold in the soil is what keeps it from washing away during storms. The living root bridge is extremely strong and can even bear the weight of a whole herd of wild elephants while crossing the bridge. It is believed that root bridges can live up to 500 years, and this Manglahaya has 80 living root bridges in its hilly forests. <clears throat> so 
So that's some of the countryside. And let's take a look at some of the cities. Um, on this uh, slide, you can see uh, on the bottom are two of the older cities, and I really mean older cities, the older construction, uh, the narrow roadways, the uh, number of people that are crowded into those streets. And on the upper, upper section are the new cities that are being built in India. So India has 48 cities with more than a million people, 405 cities with a, between 100,000 and a million people, and 2,500 cities with between 10,000 and 100,000 people. The largest city in India is Mumbai, and New Delhi, the second largest city, and is the national capital of India. It is situated in the north central part of the country, adjacent to and just south of Delhi city, which is the old Delhi, and within the Delhi National Capital Territory. The cities pictured, old and new, present the difference in the success India has had in moving into the modern world. India has established a national smart cities mission, which is an urban renewal and retrofitting program by the government of India with the mission to develop smart cities across the country, making them citizen friendly and sustainable. So two cities that we're going to mention here out of the thousand or so cities that we could talk about are Varanasi, and Varanasi is a district in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. And with Varanasi city as the district headquarters. Varanasi is one of the most beautiful, historical and spiritual cities in Northern India. The first settlements date back to the 11th century BC, making it one of the oldest inhabited places of the world. Varanasi is famous for its production of silks and brocades with gold and silver thread work. A renowned carpet weaving center is at Badoi. Wooden toys, bangles made of glass, ivory work, brassware are also provided in or produced in Varanasi. This city is host to uh, numerous religious festivals. Another city in Dori is located on the western region of Madhya Pradesh, is one of the most important commercial centers of that state. Indori is a lovely city and what makes it even lovelier is how clean it is. It is also considered as an education hub of the state of Madhya and has campuses of both the, Indusut, the India Institute of Technology and the Indian Institute of Management. Indori has been selected as one of the 100 Indian cities to be developed as a smart city under the smart cities mission. So some of the architecture, some of the really old architecture, as you can see the dates on the, on the pictures on this slide, um, are sites to see. And you are viewing some of the most interesting architectural structures in the world. Uh, to discuss two of them briefly, the Tawa, the Hawa Mahal is a palace in the city of Jaipur, India. It's built from red and pink sandstone and is on the edge of the city palace. Hawa Mahal, also known as Palace of Breeze, was built in 1799 as an extension to the royal city palace. The Hawa Mahal is the tallest building in the world without a foundation. And because of the lack of one, the palace is fitted at an angle, is tilted, excuse me, at an angle of 87 degrees. Named Palace of the Winds for a clever cooling system that sent breezes through the inner rooms during the intense Rajasthani summers. The Hawa Mahal unique attraction is its 953 windows that cover the lace-like walls to allow the royal ladies to watch the daily drama in the street below without being noticed. I don't know if you can see any of the windows. I don't know that I can see them either, but according to this, they're in there somewhere. Another one to discuss, uh, and one that most of us know, at least the name is the Taj Mahal. It's an ivory white marble mausoleum on the right bank of the river Yamuna in the India city of Agra. 
It was commissioned in 1632 by Mughal, by the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan to house the tomb of his favorite wife, Muntaz Mahal. It also houses the tomb of Shah Jahan himself. The tomb is the centerpiece of a 42 acre complex, which includes a mosque, a guest house, and is set in formal gardens batted on three sides by a crenellated wall. The Taj Mahal was designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1983, 1983 for being the jewel of Muslim art in India and one of the universally admired masterpieces of the world's heritage. It is regarded by many as the best example of Mughal architecture and a symbol of India's rich history. The Taj Mahal attracts more than 6 million visitors a year. And in 2007, it was declared a winner of this new Seven Wonders of the World initiative. <clears throat> um, we talk about, uh, we'll, we will talk about the governance of India. And early on in the governance of India, uh, there was the Sultanate. And I had mentioned earlier that the country had a violent past. Well, India is a diverse country where over 22 major languages and 415 di 15 dialects are spoken. It could be understood why disputes between provinces might not be able to be resolved via civilized conversation. So let's fight it out, must have been the rallying cry. Holding power was a key driver a lot of, of a lot of disputes, and in an attempt to maintain order and civility, the Sultanate was established in most states. Sultans ruled the country in the 13th century. The Delhi Sultanate was established as clearly the largest and most powerful of a number of competing states in North India. While a, sultan, while a sultan shuttled to and fro in an attempt to put down rebellions in practically every province, the effort was extremely time consuming and he was only marginally successful. By 1394, there were only two sultans left and both of them were residing uh, in or near Delhi. The result was bitter civil war for three years. Meanwhile, the disastrous invasion of Tamur drew nearer. Tamir invaded India in 1398 when he was in possession of a vast empire in the Middle East and Central Asia and dealt the final blow to the effective power and prestige of the Delhi, Delhi Sultanate. <clears throat> All right, and then later we had the East Indian Company, which was an English and later British joint stock company founded in the 1600s. It was formed to trade in the Indian Ocean region initially with the East Indies, which is the, the Indian subcontinent in Southeast Asia, and later with East Asia. The company seized control of large parts of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, they colonized parts of Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. They kept trading posts and colonies in the Persian Gulf residencies. And at its peak, the company was the largest corporation in the world, competing with the Dutch East India Company, and had its private army of around 260,000 soldiers, which is twice the size of the Army of Britain. The company rose to account for more than half of the world's trade during the 1700s and early 1800s, particularly in basic commodities like cotton, silk, indigo, indigo dye, um, sugar, salt, spices, tea, and opium. The company also ruled the beginnings of the British Empire in, in India. The company eventually came to rule large areas of India, exercising military power and assuming administrative functions. <clears throat> company rule in India effectively began in 1757 after the Battle of Plassey and lasted until 1858 when the Government of India Act 1858 led to the British crown assuming direct control of India in the form of the new <clears throat> British Raj. <clears throat> the British Raj 
um, refers to the period of British rule on the Indian, Indian subcontinent between 1858 and 1947. The system of governance was instituted in 1858 when the rule of the East India Company was transferred to the crown in the person of Queen Victoria. In the later half of the 19th century, both the direct administration of India by the British crown and the technological change ushered in by the industrial revolution had the effect of closely intertwining the economies of India and Great Britain. The British signed treaties and made military and trading alliances with many of the, many of the independent states that made up of India. The British were very effective of infiltrating these states and gradually taking control. Railways, roads, canals, and bridges were rapidly built in India, and telegraph links were rapidly established in order that raw materials such as cotton from uh, India's hinterland could be transported more effectively to ports such as Mumbai and subsequent export to England. Likewise, finished goods from England were transported back just as efficiently for sale in the rising Indian markets. More tellingly, the later half of the 19th century, we also saw an increase in the number of large scale famines in India. And although these famines were not new to the subcontinent, these were particularly severe with tens of millions dying and with many critics, both Indian and British, laying blame at the doorsteps of the looming colonial administrations. So as, long, so as well as all this advancement in India sounded good, there were also some consequences. The lasting impact of the British Raj is the transformation of India into an agricultural trading economy. Therefore, some areas of India, predominantly in affluent urban areas, have benefited from legacies of the British Raj in the long term due to the transformation of Indian economy, economic culture to a production-based economy. However, the majority of Indian society has experienced a ne negative impact of the British Raj, especially in rural and suburban areas due to the focus of investment into transportation, such as railways and canals, Rather than, rather than into healthcare and primary education. Now in um, 1858, we have the founding of the Indian National Congress that marked the beginnings of the effective organized protest for national self-determination. The steps were taken towards self-government in British India with the appointment of Indian counselors to advise the British viceroy, which is the uh, person appointed to rule a country or province as the <laughs> deputy of the British government. Uh, the established and the establishment of provincial councils with Indian members. The All India Azad Muslim Conference gathered in Delhi in April 1940 to voice its support for independent and united India. The pro separatists uh, all, all Indian Muslim League worked to try to silence those nationalist Muslims who stood against the partition of India, often using intimidation and coercion. The murder of the All India Azad Muslim Conference leader, Allah Bakshish <laughs> Sumaru, also made it easier for the All India Muslim League to demand the creation of a Pakistan. The labor government in India, uh, exhausted by the recently concluded World War II, decided to end British rule of India in the early 1947. British announced that Britain announced its intention of transferring power no later than June 1948. As independence approached, the violence between Hindus and Muslims in the provinces of Punjab and Bengal continue unabated. With the British army unprepared for the potential increase of violence, the new Viceroy Louis Montbatan advanced the date for the transfer of power, allowing less than six months for the mutually agreed plan for independence. So as we talk about the governance of, uh, of India and, this, and the succession of, of the methods in which it was governed, 
uh, we just take a, want to take a minute to talk about the creation of Pakistan. Pakistan, which is populated mostly by Muslims, was brought into being at the time of the partition of British India in response to the demands of Islamic, Islamic nationalists as articulated by the All India Muslim League previously mentioned. In June 1947, an agreement was reached to a partition of the country along religious lines. The predominantly Hindu and Sikh areas were assigned to the new India and predominantly Muslim areas, Muslim areas to the new nation of Pakistan. The plan included a partition of the Muslim majority province of Punjab and Bengal. Um, and in the, in the years leading up to the partition of India, the pro-separatist All India Muslim League violently drove out Hindus and Sikhs from the Western Punjab in all anywhere between 250,000 and 500,000 people on both sides of the new borders died in the violence. On August 14th, 1947, the new dominion of Pakistan came into being with Muhammad Ali Jinnah sworn in as his first governor general in Karachi. British rule formally ended on August 15th, 1947. So going forward, we thought we would mention some of the key leaders of India at its, uh, when it reached its freedom from India, from British rule and move forward, uh, move the country forward. So some of these people are gonna be familiar to most of us that lived in the 50s and, and the 60s because their names and their activities were in the national news on a regular basis. Mohammed Gandhi was an Indian lawyer, anti-colonial nationalist and political ethnicist who employed nonviolent resistance to lead the successful, successful campaign for India's independence from British rule and to later inspire movements for civil rights and freedoms across the world. Known as the father of the nation, Muhammad Karachiman Gandhi, popularly known as Mahatma Gandhi, was a spiritual leader who advocated peace and nonviolence all throughout his life. Strange but true, this great man, who's every, who, whom everyone loved and admired, was assassinated on January 30th, 1948. Mahatma Gandhi was shot dead by a university student activist in New Delhi. He was killed while he was about to address a prayer meeting. The assassin was a Hindu nationalist associated with the extremist Hindu Mahashabha which considered Gandhi responsible for making India weak by dividing the country into India and Pakistan. So then we have Jawaharlal Nehru, and I know most of us know that name also. Uh, Nehru was a principal leader of the Indian national movement in the 30s, the 1930s and 1940s. And upon India's independence in 1947, he served as the country's first Prime Minister of Independent India for 17 years. Nehru remained popular with the Indian people despite India's defeat in the Sino-Indian War of 1962, for which he was widely blamed. Domestically, he promoted democracy, socialism, secularism, and unity, adapting modern values to Indian conditions. His premiership spanning 16 years, 268 days, which is to date the longest in India, ended with his death on May 27th, 1964, due to a heart attack. Another name I think that should be familiar is Indira Gandhi. Indira was an Indian politician and a central figure of the Indian National Congress. She was the third prime minister of India and was the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru. Known as the Iron Lady of India, Gandhi was the prime minister of India during 1966 through 77 in 1980 through 84. She instituted major reforms, including a strict population control program in 1971. She mobilized Indian forces against Pakistan in the cause of East Bengal's secession. She overstalled, overstalled the incorporation of Sikkim in 1974. 
During the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971, her government supported the Bangladesh Liberation War, which led to the formation of a new country, Bangladesh. In 1984, she ordered the army to move into the Golden Temple complex of the Sikhs at Amritsar, with the intent of crushing the Sikh militants hiding inside the temple. Some 450 Sikhs died in the fighting. She was later shot and killed by her own Sikh bodyguards in revenge. We have another Gandhi, Rajav. And Rajav was the eldest son of India, Indira Gandhi and the seventh prime minister of India. He was also an efficient leader like his mother. He supported science and technology development in the country and he focused on improving relations with the Soviet Union. He was assassinated on May 24, first 1991 by a suicide bomber. The bomber was a member of a terrorist group of Sri Lanka. Along with Raj Eve Gandhi, there were 14 others who were also killed in the bomb blast. His assassination was a great shock to the people of India. Last person we're going to talk about is Louis Mountbatten. Lord Mountbatten, and the Lord is the general title for a prince or a sovereign, was a member of the British royal family and military officer. After World War II, he was made Viceroy of India, of British India, and then first Governor General of the Dominion of India, being the last British person to hold either of these positions. He was later made Viceroy of India. Actually, we just covered that. We mentioned him though, due to the fact that he was instrumental in bringing about the early date for the transfer of power to India, self-government in 1947. As you recall, uh, Britain had said that they were gonna leave uh, the country in 1948 uh, and wars and people were being killed by the thousands and Mount Batten was instrumental in getting that date moved up to August of 1947. In August 1979, Mount Batten was assassinated by a bomb planted aboard his fishing boat in Ireland by members of the Provisional Irish Republican Army. So the seat of power can be a risky business in India. In summary, the assassination of famous political leaders has always been prompted by some religious, political, ide ideological, or military reason. In Indian history, we have come across many political personalities have met their deaths not naturally due to age or illness, but have been assassinated. Violence and war, again, was considered to be a primary solution to alternate forms of resolution. There we go. Something I learned <laughs> was that India has both presidents and prime ministers, but their, their president isn't something like uh, we have in our country. <clears throat> so the current president's name is Ram Nath Kovind. <clears throat> Now, in, in practice, ordinarily and effectively, executive authority is vested in the prime minister, and then their chosen council of uh, ministers through the president of India is the constitutional nominal or ceremonial head of state. Before entering politics, Kovind was a lawyer for 16 years and practiced in the Delhi court uh, and Supreme Court of India until 1993. The current prime minister is Narendra Modi. The prime minister of India is the head of government of the Republic of India. And ordinarily the executive authority is vested in the prime minister and their chosen council of ministers. He is serving as the 14th and current prime minister of India since 2014. He is the first prime minister to have been born after India's independence of, in 1947 and is the second prime minister not to belong to the Indian National Congress. He also, also has won two consecutive majorities in the lower house of India's parliament. <clears throat> he is also the longest serving prime minister from a non-Congress party.
Uh, India is also comprised of states and union territories. And also these states aren't something like we have in our country. Uh, India is a union of states. It is sovereign, secular, a democratic republic with a parliamentary system mm -hmm. of government. In the states, the governor, who is the representative of the president, is the head executive. The system of government in the states closely resembles that of the union. <clears throat> There are 28 states and eight union territories in the country. Union territories are administered in the, by the president through the administrator appointed by him or her. A union territory is a type of administrative uh, division of the Republic of India. Unlike the states of India, which have their own governments, union territories are federal territories governed in, heart, in part or by whole by the union government of India. Therefore, we can say that Union Territories of India are those regions which are directly gov governed by the Union government. Some of them, like the Delhi and Puducherry, have legislatures while others do not. Now, a state is a self-governing po political entity. The term state can be used interchangeably with country and local authorities have the power to make laws and regulations and also enforce them. A state is ruled by one of the following, either an elected governor and by state legislator, a governor who, who is usually the ruler of a constituent state appointed by the president of India and an elective legislature, or a governed by a chief commissioner appointed by the president of India. <laughs> So, in light of all these struggles, unrest, violence, and discontent throughout the centuries, among the varying factions that we have just highlighted, what has India accomplished and what does it look like today? So we're going to end our presentation with a very informative and short video that sums up the progress India has made in the last 50 years.
surprise, surprise, huh? So in conclusion, while many in America are pushing equity, critical race theory and transgenderism into our culture and school systems in particular, dumbing down future generations in an attempt to destroy the foundations of our great country, India is producing leaders, doctors, engineers, and scientists. As a country, we are intentionally destroying ourselves from within. That concludes our presentation. We hope you have found this interesting and informative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our online winner today was Constant Y. So you receive our, our book on the mafia democracy. You'll be getting that. And we have an upcoming documentary on August 4th. And I'm excited to see that. And I want to thank everyone for coming out. To take our... a, can we take a couple questions? Oh, yeah. Sure. We've got three questions online. The first is from yeah. the winner of, um, of, of our uh, online prize. Is East India Trading Company and British Empire legacy still a reminder in modern in modern India? Uh, what's the question, though? Is East India Trading Company and British Empire legacy still a reminder in modern India? I think it is only because the impact that the East India Company had in developing the country, in particular in the agricultural area still has uh, an impact. Whether or not that legacy continues indefinitely, I'm not sure. Second question, why are many international companies, even US origin run by Indians? And she, re she referenced three, Belt and Road or ESG. Well, that's a pretty good question. Um, it could be that we don't have anybody as smart as those uh, gentlemen that are running those corporations that we saw, um, because while a lot of those companies were formed as American companies, they are international. Uh, it's just interesting to me that so many of the CEOs and ranking uh, people in those companies are Indian uh, and not American. This is a great question too from Rick. Can India supply 100% of its food needs? Of what? Can India supply 100% of its food needs? Um, that's a good question. Famines have, uh, have occurred in India over the centuries. Just recently, India, which is one of the world's leading wheat producers, has cut off the export of wheat to protect uh, its own population from famine. So the answer is, for the most part, yes. The question is, is, is how long will supplies last? Thank you. John, we had one question over here. <clears throat> Our government has three branches. And I just wondered about the Indian government. And I think our three branches keep it from ever becoming a dictatorship. How does that compare with the government in India? Um, well, even though the government and even though the subcontinent of India has a what I would call a federal government in, in, in New Delhi, and it has the states which govern themselves, similar to what we have, I think there's a big difference in the fact that those states are not a United States of India like we have a United States of America. So um, it's never become uh, a dictatorship. And I don't know that it ever could because violence is still an option for solving any issues, including an overreach by what I would call their federal government. What about the comparing it, the federal government, we have three branches, which I think are very effective. And the, you know, the, the executive, the legislator, and the judicial, and does, do they have anything comparable to that? I don't think so, because if you look at the way our three branches are designed, uh, we, have, we have the legislative branch, which sets precedent for the country. And so all the states are 
bound by uh, whatever laws they make. I don't believe India has that kind of a, a governmental process. I don't believe. We could have spent another couple of weeks here discussing India. Uh, hopefully we didn't bore you with the details that we did bring. Uh, trust me, it was very minor and minimal compared to what we researched through. <clears throat> Any other questions? Perhaps a misconception or not of India is that it has two two classes like abject poverty and then very wealthy and that there's not much of a middle class. Is that a misunderstanding? Well, it's 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 hard to tell. I am sure there obviously are the very wealthy. Um, and I am sure that some of the people there would consider themselves middle-class status, but it is a country that has a high percentage of poor people and, and how they're going and how they're going to deal with that to bring those people along into a, an upper, upper poor class or lower middle class, I do not know. Any, any more questions? Again, we appreciate your attention, your time, and uh, we hope that uh, all of you were able to stay awake through the presentation. Mm -hmm. So we have our, our, our uh, documentary we're showing August 4th, and our next semester begins um, in mid-September. September 20th, and we look forward to seeing you all there. Um, thank you for coming to our short summer session and go out and empower you. All right. <laughs>